Okay. Today we have a team from the nursing faculty. These are the diploma students who are in their third and final year. So first of all, I would like to register apologies on behalf of Ms. Shinondo, who is our host for this platform. However, we'll continue. So I'll play two roles today. I'll be the host as well as the moderator for today's topic. So without wasting so much time, I'd like to acknowledge the presence of our head of department, that is Ms. Ilvanda, who may be logged on online, as well as the dean, that is Mrs. Masebe, equally might have logged on online. Additionally, we have faculty members, those are lecturers under the department who will join us online. Of special note is Mr. Single, Mr. Sanga, Mrs. Phil Dadaka, as well as Mrs. Warrior. I would also like to acknowledge the professorial team who will join us online and probably physically here with us in the boardroom. So today I have a panel of three diploma students. This is none other than Juana, Rosemary, and Chawa. So without further ado, I would like to introduce the first presenter for today, who is none other than Charwa Sinonde. Charwa, the floor is all yours. Thank you very much, sir. I welcome you all to this presentation. Uh, our presenters, as they said, we have Juana Ndumba, Rosemary Kaombe, Chala Sinombe and our moderator, Mr. Kavanga who is also our host. Yeah. Just hold on. We need to share the screen. Okay, you can proceed, Chala. Okay. And our presentation today is on diabetic ketoacidosis. And to start with, we're going to start with the demographic data. So the name of the patient is GS, JS for private sex, sex, female, age 33 years old, the diagnosis, diabetic ketoacidosis, secondary to poor drug compliance in non-diabetic mellitus type 1. And then this patient was admitted on 18th April 2023. The time of admission was 1246 hours. And then notes the patient came as a referral from Mutendere Health Center to Levi Manawasa General Hospital for further management of diabetic ketoacidosis. And we go to the history of presenting content. Under the history of presenting content, we have present health status. Vomiting for one day, patient reported to have had five episodes consisting mainly of water, food particles on the day of admission, pain on the lower and the left lower quad, quadrant for one month, dizziness for one day, polyuria, polydipsia, polyphagia. Patient says to have been experiencing peripheral neuropathy and general body weakness. On the treatment prescribed, Platsil 2 mils in 5 mils, Nifedipine 20 milligrams per oral start, Enelapril 10 milligrams per oral start, Motifamine 500 milligrams per oral start, Downil 500 milligrams per oral start, and then Ringer's Lactate 500 mils in 500 mils IV start. All the above drugs were prescribed on referral from Tender Health Center. Past health history, GS is non-diabetic mellitus patient for 10 years, but had not been on medication for the past five years. Claiming doctors from the University Teaching Hospital instructed her to stop, med to stop taking medication as they intended to change the doses after observation of the patients of drugs. Patient 
has been non-concerned on how he did not prescribe low sugar diet for five years. JS is also a non a non-hypertensive patient for one month. And now we go to the obstetric history. And under the obstetric history, JS is gravida four, para three, with two being delivered via spontaneous vaginal delivery and one cesarean section. We now go to the social history. Patient drinks alcohol at least five, four to five bottles of mossy lager a day. And then JS reported to have never smoked in her life. Patient is a bartender in a known bar within Mutendere neighborhood. JS stays in, in a four bedroom house with, with young sister and four children along with four other people. JS appeared slim. JS appeared slim. JS appeared slim. JS frequently eats and gets tired easily. No edema. Patient was fully awake, oriented to time, place, signs of distress. We go to the personal psychological history. Patient was anxious to leave the hospital facility, adding she was needed at her place and occasionally having a feeling the sister and the children were not in safe, were not safe enough in her absence. The patient said the house was adequate for the family and has no healthy and security hazards except increased crime rate around the neighborhood. And then the source of water is communal tap water. Sorry for that. We now go to the drug history. Patient was prescribed on insulin six international units hourly until RBOs was below 13 millimoles, then switched to three international units hourly. And then we go to the fluids. Ringer's lacquer was prescribed one liter in 30 minutes, one liter in one hour, one liter in two hours, one liter in three hours, one liter in four hours respectively. And vitamin B complex was prescribed as well, 100 milligrams once daily per hour. Nifedipine, 20 milligrams, 12 hourly per hour. Moderated, 5 milligrams, 12 hour, hourly per hour. The drugs, the drugs above were prescribed prior to admission. I'll not pass, this is why I ended my presentation. I'll pass it to the next presenter. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Kaombe Rosemary, and I will run you through the summary of history. We are presenting on JS with history of polyuria, polydipsia, polyphagia, dizziness, vomiting, pain on the left lower quadrant, abdominal pain, getting tired easily. JS is a non-diabetes mellitus patient hypertensive with poor compliance to antidiabetics for five years. Patient reported of numbness when she takes drugs as well as an explained weight gain coupled with fatigue and abdominal discomfort. Impression, diabetic ketoacidosis secondary to poorly controlled diabetes mellitus with DM neuropathy. 
the physical examination, the vitals were respirations, 20 breaths per minute, the temperature was 36.7 degrees Celsius, the blood pressure systolic was 111 millimeters of mercury, over the diastolic 72 millimeters of mercury on admission. The patient weighed 56 kgs. General survey, JS was clean, appeared slim, with dry skin and had no edema. On inspection, we inspected JS for anomalies such as skin rashes and swellings. Skin was normal. On palpation, we palpated JS's abdomen for tenderness and guarding both absent and no edema was present. On the skin, JS's skin was normal to visible skin lesions, but not a decreased skin tagger. On auscultation, we auscultated JS and appreciated heart sounds with no audible crepitations, but noted mild cosmo breathing. No systolic murmurs were heard. Head to toe examination was also done. On the skin, JS skin was normal to visible skin lesions, but noted decreased skin tagger. In the eyes, Patient had no signs of pallor. The neck, no lymphadenopathy was noted in this region, but visible jugular vein distension. Abdomen was soft and non-tender. The limbs, there was pitting edema of both lower limbs was noted and tingling sensation in the soles of the feet. Investigations done were urinalysis, Proteins were three plus, blood was positive, ketones three plus, glucose two plus. The full blood count was also done. White blood cell count, red blood cell count, red cell distribution width, platelets were high, while platelet distribution width was low. Differential count, neutrophils, monocytes, and platelets were high. HIV rapid test, Patient was non-reactive. Abdominal ultrasound reviewed grade one bilateral hydronephrosis. Biochemistry was normal. Summary of full blood count and differential count. The following were high. White blood cells, 10.39. Red blood cells, 4.98. Neutrophils 7.04, monocytes 1.18, platelets 4.99. Management and treatment. Insulin was administered. Sorry, insulin was administered six international units per hour until red blood and until random blood sugar was below 13 millimoles, then switched to three international units per hour. Bringers lactate one liter in 30 minutes, one liter in one hour, one liter in two hours, one liter in three hours, one liter in four hours, respectively. Vitamin B complex, 100 milligrams once daily per oral. Nifedipine, 20 milligrams, 12 hourly per oral. Moderatic, five milligrams, 12 hourly per oral. This is where I end with my presentation. I will hand over to my colleague. Okay. Uh, I'm going to continue from where my colleague ended. And uh, I'm going to run you through the nursing care plan. So after assessing JS using the nursing process, we identified the following problems. Our first problem was imbalanced nutrition, less than body requirement. Our second problem was fluid volume deficit. Our third problem was ineffective breathing pattern. Our fourth problem was a risk for infections. So uh, our uh, starting with our first problem, which is imbalanced nutrition, less than body requirement. 
our nursing diagnosis was that imbalanced nutritional status would be related to insulin deficiency. Of course, in this case, there will be decreased uptake and utilization of glucose by the tissues, resulting in increased proteins or fat metabolism, of course, which would be evidenced by increased ketones of 3+. Plus. And our objective, or rather the goal was patient who have a balanced nutritional status within 48 hours of our nursing care. Our first intervention was that we would provide liquids containing nutrients and electrolytes as ordered as soon as patients can tolerate oral fluids. Our rationale for this intervention was that we would do it to replace lost nutrients and electrolytes. Our second intervention was we would observe for signs of hypoglycemia we would observe for signs of hypoglycemia, such as changes in levels of consciousness, cold and clammy skin. Our rationale for this intervention was that to note any signs of comatose and notify the doctor for further action. Our third and last intervention on this problem was that we, of course, would administer insulin as ordered by the physician, and uh, our rationale, obviously, for this intervention would be to promote glucose uptake into the tissue cells. After implementation of our interventions uh, to this problem, our evaluation was that JS's nutritional status improved after 48 hours of nursing care, of course, which was evidenced by absence of ketones in urine on uh, urinalysis. Our second problem was fluid volume deficit. Our nursing diagnosis being fluid volume deficit would be related to polyuria, evidenced by signs of dehydration, such as clammy skin. And our objective, or rather the goal, was patient who attain an adequate fluid volume within 24 hours of nursing care. And our interventions first be we would administer IV fluids, such as Ringer's lactate and normal saline, as ordered our rationale to replace lost fluids and electrolytes. Our second intervention was we would provide oral fluids as soon as patient can tolerate in order to replace lost fluids. Our third intervention was we would closely monitor the fluid input and output, which of course would be to prevent fluid overload. After intervention of our, uh, implementation of our interventions, our evaluation was that JS attained an adequate fluid volume within 24 hours of our nursing care of course, which was evidenced by absence of signs of dehydration, such as a clammy skin. Our third problem was ineffective breathing pattern. <coughs> Sorry. Our third problem was ineffective breathing pattern. Our nursing diagnosis being ineffective breathing pattern would, would be related to conversation of metabolic acidosis evidenced by rapid respirations and use of accessory muscles of breathing. Our objective, or rather the goal, was that patients who have an effective breathing pattern within 30 minutes of nursing care. And our first intervention was, we would elevate the head, uh, the head end of the patient's bed in order to promote lung expansion. Our second intervention was we would administer IV fluids such as Ringer's lactate as ordered, and our rationale would be to counteract acidosis and promote blood circulation. Our last intervention was we would also administer oxygen as prescribed 
in order to promote good tissue perfusion. And our evaluation with regard to this problem was that JS attained a better breathing pattern after 45 minutes of our nursing care, which was, of course, evidenced by rapid respirations and use of accessory muscles of breathing. Our fourth and uh, last problem identified was risk for infections. Uh, our nursing diagnosis being risk for infections would be related to increased levels of glucose and decreased leukocyte function. Our objective was patient will be free from infection throughout nursing care. Our first intervention was we would observe for the signs of infection, such as fever, cloud urine. Of course, our rationale would be for any detection and prompt management of the underlying condition. Our second intervention was that we would ensure that we maintain aseptic techniques during IV insertion and administration of medications. Obviously, our rationale was increased glucose in the blood creates an excellent medium for bacteria to thrive. Our third and last intervention was we would educate JS about perineal hygiene in order to prevent urinary tract infections or other UTIs. Our evaluation was JS was free from infection throughout nursing care, which was of course evidenced by absence of signs and symptoms of infection, such as fever. And uh, we further on went ahead to bring out the possible complications of diabetic, or rather diabetes ketoacidosis. Our first possible complication being cerebral edema, our second being intracranial thrombosis or infarction, acute tubular, uh, tubular necrosis, peri peripheral edema, urinary tract infections, and hypertension. That is where I end with my segment. And all right, thank you very much, Steve, for that wonderful presentation. So, audience, that is the work that our students did. So, before we go into question and answer, at this stage, we'd like to do a simple roll call. So, just by show of hands, you raise up your hand. If you check in there, there's a reaction, you can raise up your hand. So, can we have hands of those who are following us? from main campus of Chalala. How many are listening in from Chalala campus? Audience from Chalala campus. Okay, we have Wupe, Grace now. Grace Makwembo, taking okay, one, five, okay. <laughs> Rose Kamangala, okay. Those logged on, from University Teaching Hospital. Those who are following us from UTH. Okay, we have Martha and Kavika, <laughs> iPhone and Galaxy. I don't know who these <laughs> participants are. <laughs> okay. Those listening from Kawe, those who are following us from Kawe, Okay, Kawe, we have Venaret. Any other from Kawe? Okay, Ndola. Anyone listening in from Ndola Campus? Ndola Campus? We don't have Ndola audience today. Okay, then any other now? Those who are listening in from other sources other than maybe Usaka and Kabul. 
So we have Jennifer. We have Teresa Katongo. All right, thank you very much for that. Okay, so at this time, we'd like now to check in our inbox if there are any questions. So if you have any question or clarifications or indeed contributions, you can simply do that in the comment section. Equally, you can switch on your audio and pause your question. So at this stage, we're now inviting questions and answers from the audience. Let's see if we have any questions. Do we have any questions? If you can't manage to type in, then you can simply switch on your mic and you raise your hand first, then you pose your question. So I don't know if Kilian wants to pose a question. Kilian, you can go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, I've got a question. Okay, so... Uh, uh, Go ahead. Excuse me. Oh yes. Yes. Um. On the on the management, I've got a question. Like when you're dealing with such a case, from the history, I heard you talked about that. This is a the person that drinks alcohol. Uh, is it is it not important? Like, in terms of counseling, you counsel your patient about the alcohol, looking at the fact that when you look at the triggers of DKA. Alcohol consumption is one of them. This time around, when the patient came, the trigger was poor compliance. The next time this patient comes, it could be due to other factors. So I think when you are part of the management, it's important to counsel your patient about, first of all, the compliance. You tell the patient, say, if you don't take these medications, you come back again. If you are drinking alcohol, that's the way you are drinking, the trigger next time will be alcohol. I don't know, but like on, on the management, what is it not important to counsel your patient about these things? Thank you Thank very you. much, Pia. You appreciate that. Uh, can we take another question? So we get getting questions in set, then our panel can respond to that. So we'll get another question so that our panel can respond to sets. Okay. So in the Comment section, we have a question from Galaxy A02. So it says, your panel will pay attention. Your patient has ketoacidosis. Do you at any point observe Kuzma's type of respiration? Because I noticed you said 20 breaths per minute. Okay. So we can get those two questions. The first one was from Kilian which was asking about how did you handle that issue of this patient taking alcohol. So I think we can share those. Then the next one is asking about whose mouth respiration. So we'll go first. Thank you, Christian. And you tell us which question you are responding to. Okay, so we're starting. Same. Okay, so, so, so we can respond. Yes. Um, Mr. Killian, uh, how it is in the healthy sector, before you give any medication or before you treat a patient, you first have to counsel them. And you also give IEC before giving any medication. So this was all done when administering the drugs. And when she came back, when she became conscious, we all did that. She was told everything. She was told the what system, the complications, and she continued with the alcohol, which we say that four bottles to five bottles a day. We told her everything. And we told her the complications that can follow if she continues to taking the alcohol while on the drugs, while on the diabetes drugs. 
Any other contributions to that before we use question two? Okay, one you want to say something? Maybe on uh, on the alcohol. Uh, of course, alcohol is a uh, is a stimulator, or rather, would lead to diabetic ketoacidosis, and uh, would like to mention to Mr. Kilian that uh, sensitization, or rather, IEC was done was given to JS and would also like to mention that uh, we we had noted down the, the history that was given by the by JS to the physicians but of course we had obtained our own history as well and uh, the history of alcohol was not uh, given to the to the physicians this history was obtained by me and my colleagues, and sensitization was done orally. Uh, if yeah, sensitization was done orally by me and my colleagues, verbally rather. Yes, concerning alcohol. Okay, maybe just a follow up on that one. After you did counseling, what was the patient's uh, decision? Did the patient decide that they're going to stop, or they will continue or reduce on alcohol intake? Maybe okay. walk us through that. Uh, if, if we look at where this patient was coming from, this patient uh, socially was uh, a bartender. And uh, this was part of her life. We would say alcohol is part of her life. Of course, we gave her the information. We gave her the dangers of alcohol with regards to her condition. We gave her the IEC. But then she didn't give us... Uh, an exact positive feedback to say, I am going to stop. Her response was, I have had. Of course, she honestly spoke out to say, it's going to be hard. As uh, she jokingly added to say, me being found in a drinking place full of alcohol, stopping to drink alcohol resulting in me chasing away customers. Yes, otherwise, she responded saying, with time, she was going to stop. Okay. Yes. All right. So, so that is our answer from the team that counseling was done, but the decision to stop alcohol was not reached. So we hope that continuous counseling was provided, and therefore the risks of such a lifestyle explained to the patient. And at least continuous counseling would lead to this patient stopping such advice. Then can you have a reaction to the second question? Uh, whose mouse type of respiration? Do you want me to read it to you again? Uh, uh, no, it's fine. Okay. So Cosmos uh, type of respirations we would understand that they are, they are deep, but not exactly rapid breaths. In this nature, they were mouth, and that is why we, we end up seeing the respiration being 20, and they were not so much affected. Because in the net in their in their nature, the cosmo breaths or rather breathing was was not severe. It was uh, to our observation uh, during physical examination. We actually did uh, a recheck of the respirations, and the figure was constant as 20 breaths a minute, due to the fact that, of course, as I said. They were mild. They weren't as extensive or rather severe to affect the respirations. Okay. Any other reaction from the team? Uh, I think you take us, you know, through what is whose mouth. We may have students who are just in their first semester, and they may not even know what is whose mouth respiration breath. What is whose mouth respiration? Um, so whose mouth respirations are. This is deep, deep respirations, but not labored. Okay. Yes. So is this normal? And when do we see such kind of respiration? What is happening in the patient if you see such kind of respirations? Uh, we mostly see them in unconscious patients. Mm -hmm. Yes. 
Maybe to add on to what my colleague has said, of course, we do see an unconscious patient. But then in a case of an unconscious patient, what would make somebody unconscious is alteration to restore to rather gaseous exchange or oxygen delivery. Or in this case, we're talking about respiratory distress. So any condition that would lead one into being uh, into being in a respiratory distress kind of condition would result into Cosmo type of breathing, which we are saying is deep, but not labored, so to say. Okay. Any other contribution? If there are any, are we okay, Tim? Yes. Okay. All right. That's fine. Okay. So, in short, Cosmo's respiration was observed in this patient. Yes. Okay. That's what um, Teresa wanted to know. Okay. Galaxy, I'm saying. So we have another question. It says you mentioned gravita four para three in the obstetrics history. Is your patient pregnant? Is the patient pregnant? And why was it necessary to take that history? Can you walk us through that, Tim? So um, the reason why the patient is gravida four para three. So uh, basically, gravid or gravida means number of pregnancies and para simply means number of live births. So in this uh, situation, um, our patient was once pregnant but did not deliver a viable baby. So that's the reason why it was retained gravida for para three. And um, obstetric history is very important it will help us know like the number of births and the number of pregnancies the patient has had. It will also help us know how the, the patient's uh, menstrual cycle is. Is it regular or irregular? Noting that the patient is diabetic. It's like one of them, my colleagues are not used to add anything. And then in this case, the reason why we are put the obstetric history is because the patient had the cesarean section because of the diabetes. The type one she had, that's the reason why she had the cesarean section. Okay. Then the question is saying, was the patient pregnant? Well, at this time, the patient was not pregnant. So Teresa, the, considering the question, you're saying the patient was not uh, pregnant. There's another question, so we can take this one saying, this is a question from Kazawa. So Kazawa wants to know, was, it, was potassium replacement part of the management, considering the effects of insulin on potassium? Was potassium replacement part of the management, considering the effects of insulin on potassium? Okay. Have we gotten that question? Yeah. Can we respond to that? Uh, if uh, yes, we understand the effect of insulin uh, deficiency on uh, on potassium. Yes, in this case, uh, potassium was administered through the fluids which were given. We're talking about ringers lactate in this nature. Yes, and it was, it was that way that potassium was administered. Not, not that potassium was administered wholly as potassium to this patient under the management. Okay, so the patient was not on potassium therapy? No. Okay. All right. Then we have another question. Say, only mention gravida when the patient is pregnant. This is Teresa Tatu, who is advising you say, only mention gravida when the patient is pregnant. Okay. Are we having any reaction to that, Tim? Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we actually do mention gravida. As, as my colleague earlier said, gravida simply means the number of times one has been pregnant. Whether viable, in this case, viable, we mean whether the child was alive, or rather, or did they give birth to a viable infant or other baby 
or was it, you know, a complication? So whether the person is pregnant or not, we still bring out the gravida just to, you know, make you understand or give you the clear obstetric history of this woman and how many times they've been pregnant, regardless of whether or not they are pregnant at that particular time. Any other reactions to that on the team? Yes, um, just a contribution on what my colleague has said in his preamble. We stated that the patient was gravida 4, para 3. So if we were to write gravida 3, para 3, meaning we're leaving out that other pregnancy, but in actual sense, the patient was once pregnant and the baby died. So we are not counting it as para 4. Instead, we added it to the gravid uh, part. So that was just um, a highlight to show you that the patient has had four pregnancies and three live uh, beds or three children, I would say. Okay. It seems uh, Kilian, Kilian wants to ask okay. a question. <laughs> okay, Kilian, you can go ahead. Well, thank you very much. Uh, okay, I, I, what, one contribution first on the, the gravida. From the messages, the person that say you only use gravida when someone is pregnant, they are correct. That point you're trying to justify that the patient that the child that died, I've just forgotten there's a way that you let that information come out. When you say, para, for example, uh, she's had four pregnancies, one has died. There's a way you write like para three, something negative one or plus one. There's a way you write, but you want to use gravida. So the way you've said it to us, it means that the, uh, your patient was pregnant. When you say gravida four, para three, at that moment, it means that the patient was pregnant and that was not the case. If the, one of the child, child, whether it wasn't viable or the child died, there's a way you write. Could it be uh, para three minus one or para three plus one? I'm not just sure. We can just go and uh, research on that. My question is on Kusmos breathing. On the presenter, you said that you elicited Kusmos breathing on auscultation. And from what you've said, it's about, uh, it's about breathing and whatever. How is it that you elicited Kusmos breathing on auscultation and not on inspection? Thank yeah. you. All right, thank you very much, Kia. So before we handle the Kuzma's part, I think let's deal with the issue of gravity because it seems to be a contentious issue now. Where was the patient admitted? The, which ward or department was the patient admitted? Uh, group team. Well, the Where patient's was this assessment from? Yes, this assessment was done from a medical ward at Levy in to General Hospital. Yes. Or did the patient come for any OBS and gain problem or something like that? No, the patient was just being managed for specifically diabetic ketoacidosis and uh, diabetic neuropathy, only those two conditions. And in the medical world, you don't really get to look at gynecology. That has to do with gyne mode. All right. Yes. Okay. Then on the issue of Cosmo now, <laughs> uh, I don't know if that is what came out in the history that Kuzma's was, was noted during auscultation and not inspection. Which one is which? When can you see Kuzma's? Or when can you observe Kuzma's? Uh, that is your question, the, the team. No, was it no, during no. your auscultation or you observed Kuzma's? Uh, so during the case study, I would like to add that uh, the auscultation part, like I said earlier, when we are doing the case study, some of the information would find that the patient had given to the uh, physician. Of course, we had observed the Cosmos uh, uh, types of breaths on inspection, as we know that definitely we we're, were supposed to see them during inspection on the, it's part of the respiratory inspection and the rise and fall of the chest and everything, but the auscultation part was actually done by the physicians. But to answer your question, of course, we did observe Cosmos breathing on inspection with my colleagues. Okay, maybe there was some type of error. So Cosmos is under inspection, not auscultation, right? Yes. Okay, so I'm sure that is clear now. 
So Kuzma will observe or detected on inspection, not during auscultation. Right. Do we have any other questions or contributions? From the comment section, there is a contribution from Dovi. Dovi saying it is plus one. It is plus one. So I think this is in reference to the gravity issue, gravity and quality issue. All right, okay, we know your contribution, Dovi, and thank you very much for that. Jennifer, you still have your hand up. Do you have any contribution? Jennifer? Jennifer, is your hand up for a question or it's a time that we are mentioning where you are watching us from? Okay, do we have any other questions from the members of the audience? Any questions from the audience? So this time, either you can have a question. Okay, there's a question. Go ahead. Yes, I have a question. So I wanted to ask like, uh... Um, on your drug list, you mentioned that the patient was actually taking a uh, metformin and uh, down you. But then she was later told that uh, she, she, she stops. So I wanted to ask, like, uh, first of all, I know that uh, what I know is that if someone is type 1, I think uh, there's a part where by ins insulin should be, uh, should be the first class treatment. But now, when, when uh, she was told to stop, was she told to stop uh, the drugs only or together with the insulin? Okay. Like for, for that five, five years, right? yeah, I wanted to just carry it on that. Okay, I didn't get your name. Oh, sorry, I'm uh, Waki Sandov. Correct? Okay, all right. Thank you very much for that. So, you get the question? Oh, okay. The, the team didn't get the question, but so... Kindly rephrase the question so that they get oh, you. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So I was asking, you mentioned that uh, the patient was actually taking uh, metformin and down in our uh, medication for the diabetes. But knowing that it's type 1, I thought maybe uh, the first line treatment was uh, supposed to be like uh, maybe insulin. Yeah, so I did ask, like you mentioned after that, she was told to, by the UTH doctor, she was told to stop taking the medication. Yeah, so my question was that when she was told to stop, uh, was she like taking metformin uh, down new and insulin and later told to stop three of them or maybe she was just told to stop taking the oral medications? Okay, I think it's... Like, I don't know if she was... Yes. Yeah, like, I don't know if she was... Yeah. All right, thank you very much. So you've got the question, right? Yes. Sir. Yeah, the time that the patient was told to stop medication, was the patient told to stop all medication or just the oral drugs and continue with insulin. Can we have a reaction to that? Uh, firstly, our patients, we, we, uh, with our patients, we're mainly focusing on diabetes or rather diabetic ketoacidosis. Mm -hmm. So when this patient stops, they first stopped taking the insulin, which leads to the keto diabetic ketoacidosis. So about the other drugs, we didn't really follow it up. And then the... The hypertension, for example, in the it came a month ago, not really after five days ago. It came in a month ago, so I think they just stopped the insulin. So the patient was told to stop all the drugs? No, they didn't tell her to stop taking the drugs. She was told they were going to change her dose, and she misunderstood the doctors. Yes, and never went back for... No, she, she didn't really follow it up. Okay, any other contribution to the team? Are we safe? Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. All right, so yes. I'm sure you've gotten the, the, the response. You are saying the, the patient misunderstood the communication. They were supposed to change a dose or something like that. And then the patient never went back to the hospital. Yes, exactly. Yes. So, uh, <clears throat> This patient, uh, this patient was was brought with a complication of DKA, and we are made to understand to say that DKA came uh, came about as a result of uh, lack of compliance. So we understand that in a case of where this patient was not comply complying neither with the diet nor nor the medical management, 
we didn't we didn't really rely on the history that was given by the patient as this patient would of course they may have in a way manipulated the history do you know, do you know run away from the issue of lack of compliance but we don't really take it the doctors told this patient to strictly stop the the drugs in this case she wasn't even following the sugar free diet that she was prescribed on so we didn't really rely on the history that was given by the patient on this part of drug drugs by the, the doctors okay all right i think for the benefit of the doubt for those who are just maybe in their first year maybe you explain to them what is dka and maybe also explain what is diabetes i think we shouldn't take that for granted uh, I don't know how you share those two. At least just be brief. What is DKA? What is diabetes? What is the list they are? So, DKA is a life threatening complication of diabetes type 1, which is characterized by dehydration, electrolyte loss, and acidosis. So it comes about when the diabetic type 1 is not managed, and then the, there will be ketones, in, in, ketones will be produced, and then the ketones will be in about acidosis. Okay. Any more contributions to that? Any contributions? Yeah. Okay. okay. Then what about diabetes? Mm. So um, diabetes mellitus is actually um, a medical a metabolic disorder where insulin is uh, is not secreted enough or there's no secretion of insulin. And this condition is characterized by polydipsia, which is excessive thirst. Then there's poly polyphagia or polyphagia, depending on how you pronounce it, which is excessive hunger. Then there's polyuria, the patient's case will frequently urinate. That's how I can summarize it. Okay, uh, well, I'll say something. Yeah, maybe just to add on what my colleague has said. Of course, like she said, diabetes is a metabolic disorder. And in this case, we're talking about production of the hormones responsible for regulation of glucose in and out of the tissue cells and in this case we are saying insulin is responsible for the production of or rather formation of glucose and uh, we have of course what are called uh, called uh, hormones which do the opposite of what insulin does like glucagon uh, cortisol and the like so in, it, in this case, we're saying in a case of diabetes, there can either be, like my colleague said, insufficient production or no production at all. That is on one part. And there can also be sufficient production, but lack of absorption or less affinity of insulin to the receptors of the, the, body, the body tissues which of course will enhance or rather allow the absorption of insulin into the tissue cells. So in a case where there is uh, an interruption or an insult or rather that would result into alteration in any of these mechanisms that we've mentioned, either absorption uh, or production, there is insufficiency or there is sufficient production or they are... Oh, let me mention also that in a case where there is... Uh, no production of insulin. This would be as a result of damage, of course, of the pancreatic cells that are responsible for production of insulin. We have what are called beta cells, <clears throat> beta cells found on the isolates of longer hands. So in the case of uh, diabetes, we expect that uh, any condition that res would result into damage of these beta cells would mean that there would be no production of insulin and uh, of course, there will be more, there will be no or less production of insulin resulting into a uh, shortage of uh, glucose, of course, in this nature, because it's insulin responsible for stimulation of conversion of glucose from glycogen. 
I think that's where I can I can end. Okay, that's that's good. All right. So I guess we have heard the differences between diabetic ketoacidosis and diabetes mellitus in general. So we have a comment in the comment section. We have a contribution from Leonard Siame. Okay, so Mr. Siame is saying the subject matter was not diabetes in pregnancy. We are looking at diabetes ketoacidosis in a non-pregnant patient. So kindly drop gravita 4 para something. It is better to only mention the number of children, disease, and the cause. And I like your confidence as a team. So congratulations to you as a team. Someone has you know, noticed your confidence okay. level. So thank you very much, Mr. Siami. Next, we have a comment from Jennifer. Jennifer is saying the presentation and confidence of the team was perfect. Keep it up. The Galaxy is saying, good job. So I think you can block for yourself. That's the wonderful feedback from the audience. If there are no other questions, I think we can wrap it up now. Are there any last questions? Audience? Okay, I don't think we have any more questions. So before I close the show, we'd like to have a vote of thanks from the team that was presenting today. So let's hear our vote of thanks from the presenting team. Wana, the floor is all yours. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Uh, our vote of thanks, of course, would go to the management starting with the Dean, Ms. Kaseri, to the, starting with the Dean, Mrs. Kaseri, to the HOD, Mrs. Banda, and of course, our class tutor would go further, of course, and acknowledge our clinical instructors back at the hospital. Of course, we're even supposed to be at the ward right now. We appreciate the, <laughs> the privilege given to us to be here, and of course, we, we acknowledge the, the professors, of course, uh, and we acknowledge uh, the fact that it is a rare privilege to be given this platform and you know share the knowledge as students, express ourselves, and uh, show the knowledge that we are getting from the institution as expected, we highly appreciate and we don't take it for granted. We appreciate you as our listeners for your time and uh, all your contributions, corrections made, additions. You've been amazing. And of course, I also would like to appreciate my colleagues of course, it wasn't uh, it wasn't a one man army, as we can see, we're a team. So, with that being said, I would like to say thank you very much to my colleagues and, of course, my my able classmates, Rosemary Kaombe and Charles Nombe. Yeah, and with that, Maka. Okay, that is good, and uh, congratulations for the wonderful presentation. Thank you, sir. Deserve all the applause. All right, so we have come to the end of our Lusaka Apex Medical University Educational Clinical Virtual Gland Rounds. So, without wasting much of the time, I'd also like to appreciate this platform that has been created for our students to share the knowledge and the clinical experience that they are having. We have seen that students are able now to incorporate not only their theory but also various skills in their clinical work. With this, we are confident that at least our students are equipped with the knowledge and necessary skills to handle our patients. Special thanks go to the professor team led by Professor Lambert, Professor Mwawa, and Professor Mlenga. We also appreciate Usaka Apex Medical University Vice Chancellor, that is Professor Jerisani. I would also like to appreciate the support that received from the nursing faculty through the dean, Mrs. Masere, 
the two HODs, that is Professor Kanye Mlinga and Mrs. Banda. I would also like to thank the faculty members. Those are lecturers from the nursing department. There are too many to mention here. So with that, we look forward to the next presentation next week. Otherwise, thank you very much to everyone that participated in this clinical virtual blank round. I've seen a comment from Kazao saying, thank you very much, moderator, and kindly share the PowerPoints. I think we will find ways of sharing that information. Thank you very much, and good afternoon, and happy weekend to everyone.